Hello and welcome to Ukraine Today. I'm Vladimir Sulohub. Join me now to discuss the Minsk peace discussions regarding the war in eastern Ukraine is former Prime Minister of Ukraine, former Defense Minister of Ukraine, and the current representative and current head of Ukraine's delegation in security working group in the trilateral contact group in Minsk, Mr. Ivan Marchuk. Mr. Marchuk, welcome to Ukraine today. Hello. So, Mr. Marchuk, um, you are a part of this security working group, uh, which is part of the trilateral contact group in Minsk, which uh, constantly meets to discuss the situation in eastern Ukraine. Can you tell us what are the current main topics on your agenda? Because uh, ever since the, the, the Minsk peace agreement was achieved back in uh, February, almost a year and a half ago, the ceasefire never, never was in effect. Uh, nowadays, the main topic of our conversations, our uh, uh, discussions, is uh, the main problem to establish ceasefire regime and to withdraw military units. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, agreed uh, last year to establish so-called uh, security zone free from heavy weapons. Certainly there are some violations nowadays, uh, but still, uh, last year, approximately two months, we have such a period when there was a full ceasefire regime. You know, we have, uh, in our experience, positive results. But unfortunately, after that, a lot of violations and uh, everybody knows what happened later. Nowadays, uh, we, are trying to, um, we are trying to withdraw military units from contact line, but uh, I, uh, me, <laughs> personally, I personally call it front line, because in reality, it's not contact line. In reality, it's front line. Uh, to withdraw from uh, contact line military units for one kilometer. But uh, before that, we must reach agreement, uh, agreement about principles, how it would be done. Because uh, uh, it's a very sensitive process. You know, mistrust is very deep from both sides. And uh, just to start withdraw, uh, before that, mm, both sides uh, under mm, OSC monitoring must stop shooting. Cease, full ceasefire regime must be established during seven days, not less. Seven days. Only after that, each side just provided to OSE the coordinates of, um, of the place where, uh, where they would withdraw their units to that place. Can you, Mr. Mitchell, can you explain how does these discussions, how does these negotiations take place in practical terms? Because you have Ukrainians on one side, you have uh, Russians on the other side, and you have OSE in the middle, but the Russians can claim that they have no control or no involvement whatsoever. So how does it work? <laughs> so you, are you telling the Russians, okay, you tell these guys to take their, uh, their, their units away from the borderline? How does it work? It's very interesting. Maybe it's the main question. The main problem is that Russians, they deny. They deny that they, uh, their military forces are representative or taking part in this uh, in this war. In reality, I know very well, in reality it is a war, on all the components of a war. You know, on that temporary occupied territory, there are uh, so-called two military corps, which were established and organized by, by Russians. It's approximately 32, 36,000 military people, you know, and... Uh, Russian military. Yes, at that territory. And, um, you know, deputy commanders, beginning from commander of uh, military corp up to platoons, are Russian officers. By the way, we demonstrate them, their names, photos, uh, their biography. Russians say, no, it's internet in information. It's not true. But we know exactly our military intelligence nowadays, nowadays uh, knows almost everything, what's happening there. 
And uh, <coughs> it's one, the main obstacle that uh, the Russians don't agree publicly, officially, that they don't, that they are not involved in that, uh, in that, as they call conflict, but in reality it's not conflict. And the main, uh, the main problem is border. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Munch, you said that the public do not agree, do not confirm, uh, and they continue denying uh, of their involvement. But what about during these meetings? They're not public. Uh, what are they telling them? What are, you, what, what are they telling you? Uh, um, you know, all the time they, uh, they insist that it is internal conflict and uh, that we must to discuss everything with the representatives of the so-called DPR, LPR. Two boys from uh, Donetsk and uh, Lugansk regions, those temporarily occupied territories, they take part in the, in the discussions. Coordinator uh, allowed them just to, to take part in discussions, but they are not, um, they, uh, they don't have the same uh, authority as uh, as we have, I mean we and Russians have, but still they are taking part. And uh, you know it's the main aim of Russians just to create situation uh, when we, I mean Ukraine inside, would accept the position that it is internal conflict and that we, I mean Ukrainian part, must discuss everything with them, not with Russians which are the, the main player in these uh, situations. And, uh, you know, it, uh, it ruins uh, very seriously and very often uh, creativity of, of this process. But still, we hope, I mean, we Ukrainian side, uh, uh, to some extent, OSCE coordinator, we hope that we would reach agreement, I mean disagreement, withdrawal of military units. You know, it's very important to withdraw military units just to create situation, not only safety zone, but to create situation when snipers wouldn't see each other. When uh, s this ceasefire regime started, uh, somebody must control it. And both sides must know that representatives of monitor of the monitoring group OSCE is in this safety zone. And JCCC representatives, it means officers, approximately 70 Russian officers and uh, a, little, a little bit more Ukrainian officers. It doesn't mean that all of them, 70, would be presented there. But both sides, when they withdraw military units, must understand that this territory is controlled by representatives of OSCE. And certainly if they will start shooting, certainly it would be um, dangerous for uh, representatives of OSCE. Are they, are they willing to commit to that? Are they, is OSCE yes, willing to, to be there? You know, but in this region would be established the uh, um, remote control cameras, uh, all day and night uh, period, night cameras, uh, night vision, and so on. Well, it means that this territory would be controlled not only by representatives of OSCE and JCCC, but uh, with these special cameras. Certainly, we understand, according from our practice, that you know when we prepare when we agree just signing everything and unfortunately not all the time everything is going as it was planned but still it's new quality of withdrawal you know before uh, this uh, period all withdrawal were connected with withdrawal of heavy weapons not military units military units remained staying just against each other in some regions they are separated approximately 700 meters. They even see each other without binoculars. And that's why this uh, period is very sensitive and very important. And that's why uh, it's very serious <laughs> interest of uh, mm, uh, leaders of Normandy 4 
Would it be successful, I mean, this agreement? Well, that's, that's exactly what I was going to ask you. In your opinion, will that arrangement work? Because all the previous arrangements, they didn't work. The exchange of prisoners, all for all, didn't work. Uh, establishing of control over the border doesn't work. So will this arrangement work? Uh, frankly speaking, being experienced in negative results, 50-50. Uh, 50-50. It would depend, you know, if we would be successful, even in one region, uh, we have three almost agree from both sides, three regions. Two of them approximately for 100%. We agreed, I mean coordinates and all details and uh, peculiarities and so on. And if we would be successful with these two regions, I am absolutely sure that it would give an impulse just for another five because we have seven uh, just mm, agreed primarily um, before him. And it, 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 may, uh, it may influence on the pro positively, I mean influence on uh, mm, de-escalation. Because you know, mm, we know only our casualties, killed and wounded. Uh, our press uh, informs not very often what kind of casualties has another side. But we know exactly that they have sometimes bigger, much more uh, casualties uh, than we have, you know? Well, it means that especially civilians, mm, they, influence, uh, they influence on military structures from that side. Certainly being under influence of Russian television and uh, uh, local TV uh, programs. Certainly people, I mean people which are living on that uh, temporary occupied territories, certainly they, uh, not always they know the truth, but still, you know, this mm, temporary shooting, exchange of fire, people are killed. And that's why, uh, you know, it is not so-called annoying, but still it's connected with, uh, with casualties. Mr. Metric, my final question, um, if we could briefly discuss the Russia's involvement in, in, in this war. Earlier in our interview, you said that uh, according to your information, according to the intelligence of Ukrainian side, there is at least uh, th more than 30,000 uh, troops of regu 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 regular Russian army troops on the no, territory no, of Ukraine. No, not Russian army groups. It was mistaken in the written form. Uh, in my interview, the, I, I told that uh, 32, 36 uh, military people, it's not uh, Russian army, you know. Russians, uh, I mean uh, professional So who Russian are they? Military, who are these 30, Approximately 000? from 3 up to 6,000. Russian military troops are presented uh, on this territory. Certainly they are without ID, but still. And these two corps, yes, first and second, first it's Donetsk region and second Lugansk region. So they're locals? Uh, local, not all of them local, you know. There are uh, foreigners from Russia, but they are not professional for, um, military people, which were prepared for money, just earning and so on. And uh, professional Russian military uh, officers uh, and soldiers, it's approximately from three to six thousand. So taking into account this information, what kind of tendencies do you see? Are they, are they building up force? Are they just maintaining what they have there? Or are they gradually withdrawing? They are not going to withdraw because all the time uh, our military intelligence, they inform, I mean, even publicly, to some small increase. Tanks, not, not very much, not, not very many, but there are some increasing process, you know, in population, I mean military units. Uh, but nowadays, uh, as uh, far as our side, I mean military, mm, uh, 
they inform us as uh, negotiators. <laughs> we are not uh, afraid that Russians uh, would attack in nearest uh, month or weeks. Uh, there, there are not such uh, indications. They don't increase activity in general, but they increase more precisely. They started to use their drones even from their territory. I mean, from Russian territory, they came to our territory. Mm. I, I don't see any indications that they are mm, not trying, that they are going just to neutralize, to smooth. Sometimes, according to the political commands from uh, Kremlin, they, mm, they activate their shooting. Mainly, it happens all the time before next Minsk uh, meeting. Well, Mr. Matruk, looks like some very dire situation there. And thank you very much for finding the time to come and talk to us and share your uh, valuable thoughts on the situation in eastern Ukraine. We were discussing the current military situation in eastern Ukraine as well as the ongoing talks in Minsk with the Ukraine's representative in security working group of trilateral contact group in Minsk between Ukraine, Russia and OSCE, former Prime Minister of Ukraine and former Defense Minister of Ukraine, Mr. Yuhan Marchuk. I'm Vladimir Solohub. Thank you for watching Ukraine Today.